So far, we've looked at inspection procedures for the combustion section and the hot gas path. Now we'll move along and see what's involved in a major inspection. The major inspection includes the combustion and hot gas path inspections, together with a complete disassembly and inspection of the compressor and turbine, including stator and rotor components, the main journal and thrust bearings, couplings, and other related parts. The rotor is removed during this major inspection. This is really a major overhaul, and as such, it will require the removal of the upper half casings from both compressor and turbine. Additionally, the exhaust frame will have to be removed. In order to provide access for the lifting equipment and clearance for a clear lift, it is necessary to remove the turbine compartment roof and sidewalls. As before, the necessary materials must be available at the site to cover and protect the exposed areas of the machine during the outage. Before removing the upper half casings, jacks must be placed under all vertical joints at the compressor casing and the exhaust casing. Follow the same procedure as before with the turbine casing. With this particular machine, it is necessary to first remove the lower combustion liner so as to provide access to set the jack under the forward compressor casing. At this point, the turbine casing upper half can be lifted using the same procedure as for the hot gas path inspection. The compressor upper shells should also be removed. During this activity, commence removal of the load coupling and guard, as this is often time-consuming. Since the coupling cannot be manhandled, it is not an easy task. The coupling guard is usually split horizontally to allow us to remove the upper half. Once the coupling bolts are removed and the coupling hubs pulled back, the coupling can be removed. When rigged from outside of the tunnel, the coupling tends to tilt and become wedged. Without some sort of rigging in the tunnel, this procedure can be extremely difficult. An eye plate welded to the top of the tunnel over the center of the coupling works well. The coupling hubs should be wired back against their stops to keep them from shifting, as this will change the center of gravity and may pose a safety hazard. The accessory drive coupling should also be removed and its condition recorded. Remove the exhaust frame forward seal and exhaust frame diffuser. Remove the compressor inlet casing. After removing the turbine first and second stage upper nozzles and diaphragms, a complete set of clearances must be taken. In addition to the turbine clearances, the compressor clearances must be taken as before. The rotor must be pushed forward against the active thrust bearing and the readings taken in the left and right horizontal joint rotor bolt positions. Compressor clearances are listed on the clearance diagram. After the forward coupling and guard have been removed, the number one bearing may be disassembled. The number one bearing assembly consists of an active thrust bearing, an inactive thrust bearing, and a journal bearing. Never attempt to move the rotor with the thrust bearing disassembled, as stationary and rotating elements on the rotor may come into contact. The thrust bearing pads must be removed, and the surfaces, that is, the lands, should be inspected for thickness and taper. The tapered land bearing should be measured in all four corners of each pad. Now, the number one journal bearing must be checked. Let's review a typical journal bearing checking procedure. In conventional construction, the journal bearing consists of a liner clamped into place in the housing by a bearing cap. When opened up, we can perform a visual inspection for scoring, general wear, and loose or flaking babbit. On a new bearing, before installation, the bearing is first wiped. This is to remove the protective grease put on by the supplier. After banding both halves of the bearing together, the outside diameter is checked. 
This ensures that the new bearing is a proper fit for the bearing housing. Next, inside diameter readings are taken at the front, mid, and rear positions. They are taken both vertically and horizontally. All these readings are recorded. The number two bearing assembly consists of a journal bearing only, and inspection requirements are the same as number one. This is a new number two bearing, complete with specifications sent by the supplier. The seal clearances of both number one and number two bearings should be measured at both sides of the horizontal joint and recorded. The lower half seals need to be rolled out in order to allow rigging clearance for lifting the rotor. The one-piece rotor includes both compressor and turbine wheels and blades. The manufacturer's instruction manual will include detailed procedures and diagrams for rotor removal. Rig the rotor according to the center of gravity diagram and the particular weights. Make sure that adequate blocking is provided at both ends to keep the lifting cables away from the blading. The lower half journal bearings will still be in place at this point. As with all lifts, the initial movement must be slow and gradual so that we can make sure that the rigging is centered and equalized. The gas turbine rotor assembly is slowly and carefully maneuvered away from the turbine assembly. Once lifted clear, the rotor should be placed on supports resting on the shaft next to the coupling flanges. Measure and record the condition and diameters of the rotor journals. That is the part which runs in the bearings. Also check the sealing surfaces known as seal lands. The journals should be cleaned with a suitable solvent and wrapped for protection during the rest of the inspection. The coupling faces and rabbet fit must also be inspected. Remove any raised metal, then measure and record rabbet diameters. The compressor and turbine blading must be cleaned and inspected. Check for deposits and corrosion, and particularly look out for erosion on the compressor blading. A suitable solvent or steam cleaner may be used to wash down the rotor. Sometimes aluminum oxide blasting may be necessary to remove hard deposits. The turbine and compressor blades must be inspected for signs of wear, especially at the roots. Liquid penetrant is an effective way to inspect blades for cracks. The compressor stator vanes will receive the same cleaning and inspection as the rotor blades. The lower half vanes can be checked in place. To check the upper stator vanes, the upper half casings should be set on end to provide easy access. Any faulty blades or other components must be replaced. Throughout the inspection process, any faulty component must be replaced or repaired before reassembly can commence. Now, since the reassembly process would be somewhat repetitive, we will look at specific maintenance tasks that may be part of a major overhaul. In this overhaul, the gearbox was removed. After disassembly, the bearings were inspected and replaced. The reduction gears were inspected and were found not to be in need of replacement. At the same time, the following items were inspected. The generator bearing and slip rings. The output bus of the generator. The rectifiers used for excitation. On this major overhaul, the rotor was removed, refurbished, and has now been reinstalled in the stator. Refurbished buckets were put in the turbine rotor. The refurbished buckets came from the supplier as a set. Here are the first stage buckets, and here are the second stage buckets along with their tie rod. The refurbished buckets are numbered and must be installed in specific slots. The supplier encloses a specification sheet. This one is for the first stage buckets. It indicates slot number, blade number, and weight. You can see that some blades are designated for different slots. 
After refurbishing, each bucket is weighed, and a computer program determines the appropriate slot in order to have a balanced rotor. When the compartment is disassembled, of course, required maintenance will be performed. On this machine, during a hot gas path inspection, only the first stage buckets are going to be replaced. The compressor blades are not in need of repair. During this inspection, of course, all exposed mating surfaces of the shell must be cleaned and stoned to ensure a proper fit. The top half compressor shell is placed vertically to allow inspection and replacement of the blades. The old blades are discarded. The newly installed blades can be seen here along with the exit guide vanes. Here we see maintenance being performed on another half shell. On this machine, the exhaust casing struts need some repairs. The torque converter, which is usually in place here, has been removed and is to be overhauled. The opportunity has been taken to overhaul the atomizing air compressor motor. A major inspection of the turbine will usually include inspections of the auxiliary equipment. The lube oil system, control system, starting system, instrumentation, gearboxes and load equipment should all be inspected, cleaned and calibrated during the major inspection. We have noted that worn or faulty components must be replaced. Obviously, a good stock of spare parts must be kept on hand if or to keep outage times to a minimum. The turbine manufacturer supplies parts lists and drawings, as well as lists of special maintenance tools. This helps us in identifying and ordering these items in a timely manner. It's important for plant personnel to develop a list of recommended spare parts, along with the quantities to be stocked. Some of the general criteria used for determining the spare parts stocking requirements are criticality of the part to continue safe operation of the equipment and plant availability. Whether the part in question is subject to wear or degradation during plant startup and operation whether the part can be used as a maintenance spare to reduce plant outage durations. Examples of such parts would be the combustion section components such as combustion liners, transition pieces, crossfire tubes, fuel nozzles, etc. Also to be taken into consideration are such items as lead time associated with procurement of the part, anticipated annual usage of the part, number of identical parts installed in the turbine, cost of the part. In using these criteria, more emphasis is placed on the parts that are of a unique nature. For example, those having special material or fabrication requirements. For components that do not have any spare parts associated with them, such as electrical switches, pressure and temperature sensors, relays, etc., it is strongly recommended that a certain number of complete assemblies be stocked as spares. Since most manufacturers make a variety of gas turbines, it is important that the turbine's serial number, in addition to the parts identification, be provided when parts are ordered. This will help ensure receipt of the correct parts, incorporating the latest design improvements. Now, throughout these last two videotapes, we have focused our attention on maintenance requirements at different stages. We have looked at running maintenance, predictive maintenance, inspections, overhaul. Although this video training series deals generically with gas turbines, we have been obliged to use specific examples when demonstrating maintenance tasks. However, the overall requirements and tasks, and indeed the objectives, are much the same for all units. Please make sure you